This week we're going to be talking about the production of knowledge. And the main way that we produce knowledge is through academic research. Academic research is arguably the basis for what we really know about the world, the closest we get to truth, at least about material things. Here's the basic idea. You have systematic inquiry. So academic research requires um, for example, in the hard sciences that you use a controlled experiment and in social sciences that you use validated qualitative and quantitative methods. And this kind of inquiry is different from, say, a journalistic inquiry where a journalist might go around and ask people questions and then sort of write up what they seem to see. That's, that's considered anecdotal, like I see this now. Uh, it doesn't really tell us systematically about what's going on in the world. The research is then studied, or rather published, in uh, peer-reviewed journals. Peer review supports dissemination of work that follows current best practices, and I'm going to talk about peer review uh, later on in this lecture. What we understand to be true about the world is based on the weight of evidence from multiple studies. One study only is not enough to prove anything. Any finding must be replicated before it is accepted. And so sometimes you'll see, also journalistically, there'll be a report in a newspaper about, oh, you know, coffee extends your life or something. And that may or may not be true. It seemed to be true with one group of data. What you'd want to do is see it over and over again before you're like, yeah, I really think that's the case. Models. In a typical academic research project, the researcher uses a model or a theory. It's the same thing. A model is a theory as a starting point. A model is a story about the way things work. So here's some examples. Gravity is a force that makes things stick to the earth. That's a model. Investment in physical capital leads to economic growth. That's an economic model. Education increases human capital and therefore makes people more productive at work. Also a economics model. The model allows us to generate hypotheses which we can then test. If the evidence supports the hypotheses, then we have a useful model. There's theoretical and applied economics research projects. So some research focuses on developing theories. An economist might start with basic principles, such as the idea that firms act strategically, and then he or she comes up with a model using equations that show how game theory explains collusion. So you can do a purely theoretical research paper, research project in economics. Not in this class, not for your project. You're going to be doing applied economics. And basically what you do is test a theory using data from the real world. Sometimes the evidence points to a different model of how the world works. Something like this. Knowledge can develop in a circle. So you have a theory, you have data, you test the theory, and then something else comes up. You notice in the data, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to add that to my theory. I'm going to change my theory. And then there's more data to test it and so on. And so we have a recurring sort of development. Maybe the circle's not a, a good analogy, but a spiral of like, okay, now we understand it to be this way because we have better methods. So we have different ideas. Uh, the research is then reported in a particular format. And here's a basic format for academic papers. Um, your paper, the research paper that you're going to write, is going to follow this format. And each week, there'll be little bits of these sections, or sometimes a whole section that you'll be writing for your final paper. Uh, the first thing, every paper has an introduction. And this motivates the topic by making a case for why the topic matters. So this is this, the introduction answers the question, so what? Like, why should I care? Next is the literature review. And that summarizes the previous studies on the same topic. Now, uh, later on, or in, in, in the series of lectures for this week, I'm going to talk about the Journal of Economic Literature. That's an academic journal where all the articles are literature reviews. And those are really helpful because they basically say, OK, what is the weight of evidence on this topic from numerous studies? And in your own research paper, you look at a few other studies that are closely related and say, OK, what do we know so far about this topic? Next is the model, which you know is a, a plausible story that provides a framework for testing hypotheses. The next section describes the data. Then you have the empirical approach. In other disciplines, they call this the methods. And basically, you say, well, OK, I have a model. 
here's the data I'm going to use to test it, and here's the, uh, what am I going to do? I might look at a graphical analysis. I might run a regression. That's going to be my methods um, section. Next, you present the results. What did the empirical approach lead to? What were your outcomes? And then you conclude. You summarize the findings and you discuss policy implications. Then comes the references. So this is what we call it in economics. It's the, all the sources that you cite in the paper. Um, we do not call it a bibliography. We do not call it work cited. In economics, this section is called references. And then you have your figures and tables. These are integrated into the published articles, but come after references in the manuscripts. And that's, you're going to basically be writing a research manuscript. So in your 307 project paper, your figures and tables are going to come after the references. Okay, what's peer review? Let's come back to that question. So this is how it works. A professor does a study, writes a manuscript uh, that looks pretty much like this. The figures and tables are at the end and they send it to an academic journal. Then there's a journal editor and that person who's also a professor typically uh, removes the author's name and sends the manuscript to one to three reviewers who have published on the same topic. So the idea is that those reviewers don't know who they're reviewing. That's called a double blind um, process and the author doesn't know who the reviewers are and that way it's supposed to be more objective. Um, because you don't, you don't know who wrote it. You just are evaluating it based on its, um, the merits. Uh, let's see what else I wanted to say about that. Okay, so those are the experts that are going to review the manuscript. The reviewers write comments on the manuscript and recommend whether it should be published, and then the journal editor makes the final decision on the publication based on the reviewer's comments. There's more. Manuscripts are rarely accepted as is. The common outcome is that the author is invited to revise and resubmit. So the reviewer says, well, it's pretty good, but the author needs to address this or that. So the author does it. They make the revision uh, and resubmit. And then the revision is sent back to the reviewers. Phew! It takes a long time. Uh, time from the first submission to publication is typically a year to 18 months. It's, it's tedious. Um, it's definitely tedious. Now, your professors who are writing these manuscripts, doing the research, writing the manuscripts, sending the manuscripts off to the journals, they also act as the reviewers. Um, so it's, it's basically what we do. Um, aside from teaching, your professors are engaged in research and they're engaged in this academic process of peer review as well. Why bother? Peer review ensures a certain level of quality. The findings must be supported by data and accepted methods. Sure, mistakes still can get through, but compared to the mountain of unsupported claims on the internet, stuff you find in peer reviewed journals will be more consistently valid. And remember, no one study is perfect. Knowledge comes from the weight of evidence from multiple studies. Next up, watch the plagiarism lecture. <laughs>